The following program is a UWTV classic. Join us as we go through the lens darkly into modern photography on Upon Reflection. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. At one time, photography had to have one style directly related to painting and drawing. Today, many types of photography are acceptable, including some that do not even employ a camera. Welcome to Upon Reflection. I'm Ross Reynolds. Contemporary photography addresses our landscape, our bodies, and new technology in fresh and shocking ways. Joining us to explore some of photography's leading lights is Ellen Garvins, Associate Professor of Art at the University of Washington. Ellen, a great pleasure to have you with us on Upon Reflection. Thank you. Thank you. I think today we distrust photographs when we've seen them. We've seen so many manipulations of photographs and people disappearing from them and landscapes changed and backgrounds altered. But one of the things that, that you've mentioned is that we should have never really trusted photography. There's always an artifice to it. Could you explain that? Yeah, that's right. Photographs have never been objective truths. Um, they've always been edited or manipulated in a lot of different ways. We should never really believe in a photograph. One of the great examples of that is a photograph by Robert Doisneau done in 1958. It's a cafe scene, which he did a lot of. Um, and there's a woman sitting at a bar, and she's sort of focusing out into the distance. And there's an older man, gentleman, sitting next to her, looking at her. And it was originally made for an issue in Le Point magazine um, in France about cafes, innocent enough. Well, that photograph was taken and reproduced in a gossip tabloid um, much later and with the caption, Prostitution on the Champs d'Elysees. Well, the man in the photograph sued the agency that sold it, sued the photographer as well. Um, the photographer wasn't responsible, but the agency was found to be responsible. But the point is that we look at that image really differently when we see a caption underneath it telling us something, or we even see it in that magazine, in that gossip tabloid magazine. So uh, they're slippery. Meanings in photographs are very slippery, and they change. Well, they also always involve choice of some sort or another, and the choice of how to frame the photo yeah. can lead to an altered sense of reality. Yeah, that's right. Um, Another good example of that is Dorothea Lange's Migrant Mother, um, taken in 1936. Um, it was commissioned by the Farm Security Administration um, to document the Depression. Um, this is the most famous, one of the most famous photographs of that era. Um, we are very used to seeing it. It's very published. Um, it reminds us almost of a religious scene. It's a Madonna and childlike image. Um, we think about her plight, but we mainly think about her um, as a person and perhaps her strength and also her difficulties. Um, what we don't usually see is another image by Dorothea Lange taken on the same roll of film, probably about 30 seconds previous to the migrant mother picture. This picture is her sort of entering into the scene. We see a lot more of the conditions that she's living in. We see a lot more of the context. We see the field. We see this kind of lean-to tent. I think this sends a very different message. Um, we, it sends a very different message because we don't place the blame on her anymore. We see her in terms of the whole context and the whole situation that she's living in. Up until the last five years or so, chemicals have really been the process of photography and bathing photographs and chemical baths was how it came about. But yeah. like everything, it's become a digital process yeah. now. How has that changed photography? It's a whole different world. Um, photographs used to be objects. At this point, they're information. And you can manipulate them in millions of ways. You can edit them. You can compress time. You can 
have illusion and actual space put together. So there's so many more opportunities um, with photographs. The whole nature of it's changed. They're really not an integral object anymore. They're something else. Um, one of the artists that was earliest in discovering the computers as a artistic tool is Nancy Burson in the early 80s. She hired a computer programmer to actually write a program um, to age people. Now we see that a lot in missing children um, ads and things. Um, another piece that she did is, is this one called Big Brother. Um, it's a fusion of, let's see if we can find Looks it. like Stalin. Yeah, um, it's a fusion of Stalin, Mussolini, Mao, Hitler, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, Your generic dictator. Yes, yes. I mean, there's a sense one. of humor to it, yet there isn't. Um, another piece that she did is called First Beauty Composite, done in 1982. This is a fusion of Betty Davis, Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Sophia Loren, and Marilyn Monroe. And, and to me, she looks like Lucille Ball. <laughs> Lucille Ball, yeah. the ultimate American beauty. Right, right. Well, there's even more radical changes that photographers have, have used in, in the digital realm. Could you explain some of them? Um, well, I don't know if this is more radical, but it's another example of um, changing images, using the digital medium as a tool, not an end in itself. So they've really done a very simple thing with this. It's called Ken. It's by a team of artists, Aziz and Kusher. They've erased out all of the orifices of this portrait, this person's face. So the ears, the eyes, the nose holes, the mouth are completely erased. It's um, a kind of a frightening image. It's very frightening. It's very claustrophobic. It is really a kind of comment on technology. Um, I think the eradication of individual experience with technology. Here's, this is called Lin. It's a very simple technique, yet I think it's very powerful. Through history, we've seen how, uh, in certain cases, photographers have not even used cameras, Man Ray being one of the most famous. And that's also a photographic technique which we're seeing used today. Yeah. Uh, who does it and to what end? Well, Adam Fuss is one of the more famous contemporary ph photographers today, not using cameras at all. It's almost like some artists are going backwards and sort of rejecting technology altogether where they're using pinhole cameras or they're not using cameras at all. Adam Foos, um, this picture up now is called Love. It's done without a camera, two rabbits laying on photosensitive paper, light sensitive paper. The image is made by sh shining light down on them as well as the entrails of the rabbits are placed on the paper and the chemicals from the entrails is altering the color of the paper. They're then lifted up and the paper is processed in a traditional uh, photographic way. You know, but the I, image I, is made without a camera. I liked that photo until you got into the <laughs> gruesome details of it. Knowing how it was made changes our whole perspective on how it looks. Um, we also have noticed in the past 20 years that contemporary photography has focused on a few different subjects in different ways. And one of those is the body. How has contemporary photography looked at the body differently? Yeah. <clears throat> I would say that contemporary photographers focus on the lived-in body at this point. So that's a more internal view of the body rather than external. Photographers in the past viewed the body as a form to create beautiful compositions with, or as portraiture to sort of indicate the life of someone. Um, but today, the lived in body, so they're dealing with the stuff of the body, the flesh, the bones. They're also dealing with the politics of the body, gender, race, issues. Um, so it's, it's different, more maybe perhaps a more personal viewpoint of the body um, that photographers are doing. One of the best known photographers, at least in this age uh, is Cindy Sherman. In the late 70s, she did a series of film stills. Um, they are all self-portraits. You wouldn't know that. You don't really see her that well. You never really get a clue of what Cindy Sherman really looks like or really is. They're called film stills, but they're her, sort of her version of film stills or yes, things exactly. shot in the style of a film still. Yes. None of them, they all 
look familiar. They look like they're from a film that we've seen at some point in the late 50s or the early 60s, but in fact, they're just set up. I and think she's waiting for the flying saucer, isn't it? <laughs> and this one, she's sprawled on a bed portraying who? Um, well, she's imitating characters in those films. You, you get a sense that she's making a comment on how women are portrayed in film and advertising without specifically being any Marilyn Monroe or any specific figure. She's making a comment on the lack of identity of women in film. Now, here's an interesting photo. Tell us who made this one and what kind of manipulations of the body he was doing or she was this doing. This is Yasumasa Moromura. It's a Japanese artist. At first glance, you think they're very related to Cindy Sherman. They are, are all self-portraits. Um, they bring up a lot of other interesting issues in addition to the issues of identity that Cindy Sherman was concentrating on. Here he is, um, self-portrait as Van Gogh on the left and on the right. It's also his own face. It's a self-portrait as Marcel, as in Marcel Duchamp. Now, what, how did he do that? How did he become Van Gogh in that photo? Um, he does very elaborate setups. He's um, a skilled painter, actually. And he'll create a backdrop and create costumes and things. He often uses the digital process to photograph just his face and then place it into these um, settings. So I'm not sure exactly of all the manipulations that he's done with these, but he uses both his own painting skills and um, digital manipulation. But they're really interesting. It's about East meeting West. Um, it's about cultural imperialism, really. He's, uh, he often uses Western movie stars as well as Western painting stars um, for his subject matter. This one is taken after a Rembrandt painting of Dr. Tulip um, performing an anatomy lesson with his students. It's, it's a very famous Rembrandt painting. Well, his face is on every one of the figures, including the cadaver. Um, it's very humorous, but at the same time, you really think about um, cultural imperialism. Now, there are some photographers who have used the body as their subject. Who They're probably the most controversial photographers uh, in current in our current time period. Uh, Andre Serrano is one of them, and we've also seen Sally Mann. Her work with her children has been very controversial. Could you talk a little bit about why? I think both of the artists really go for what is uncomfortable to us as a culture. They talk about the body in ways, very explicit ways, that make us very uncomfortable. If we take Sally Mann, she's photographing her children. She's using, they look a little bit like snapshots, but in fact it's an 8 by 10 camera, which is a large camera that takes a long time to focus. So they're setups. The subjects that she deals with, with her children, are often, they seem a little violent. They're sexually explicit in some way. There's nudity often. That's what's controversial. The images are really beautiful, but there's this association of violence or sexuality with childhood that makes us uncomfortable. Tell us about this photo, Jesse's hand. Um, it's one of the few color images that she did. She, she works usually in black and white. But the hands, you, you get a sense that that could be blood or there's some kind of um, violence that has been acted upon her daughter, Jessie. But in fact, it's really dirt. Um, and she's you know, laying in the dirt and she's getting photographed from above. Angle. But there is an edge to it. You think about violence when you see the image. This is called the ditch. Um, and that calls up all kinds of feelings that the that child is being, had been buried in that ditch. Yeah, yeah it, it is about mortality, but at the same time, I see it as a kind of birth canal. Mm. So you can see it um, either way. But it is uncomfortable because this child looks as if it could have been buried. Is this a staged photo by Sally Mann? Yes. I mean, all photographs are staged to some extent. To what extent her children were playing around and made this ditch, I don't know. Um, she probably asked her son to lay in the ditch and then photographed it. Now, your photography also has taken on the subject of the body, and how have you approached it? Um, I have done a series called the Aging Skin Series. Um, it was done in 1991. Um, I was photographing um, an elderly woman. I was interested in how, as we age, the interior of our bodies becomes more visible. The skin almost becomes more transparent. 
And to me, it's an interesting question. It's about aging, but at the same time, it's about strength because we see um, in certain vulnerable areas of our body, the neck area um, or the ribs, they become more um, evident. In addition, um, at about the same time, I was also interested in mummification and animal mummification in particular. Sort of the same issue, thinking about the relationship of the internal body to the external body. In this particular piece, um, 1993, it's called Opaque Birds. The image is of a mummified falcon. So again, the, the wrapping becomes the skin. Um, the protrusions are the bones inside. I've juxtaposed it with some industrial scrap, that being a metaphor for the inside the body. It could be ribs. It could be intestines. So it's really about sort of breaking open the body and looking at the inside versus the outside. We've also seen photographers taking um, elements from the body. Andre Serrano is one mm. who most famous probably and most controversial for his image uh, called His Christ. But he's also done some other images that employ elements of the body. Could you talk a little bit about his work there? Um, yeah, he, he did a series in the 80s um, using body fluids, um, all sorts, um, saliva, blood, milk, semen, that in itself was very controversial, just you know, to directly use the body fluids. They're seen as rather threatening in this, at this time. Um, but he's really making almost a color field painting with it, the white, um, the blood, and how it spills into this water and dissipates. They're really sort of beautiful color paintings. Um, this is called Milk and Blood. Yes. Um, this one is called Blood and Semen. Um, Again, he's using highly charged bodily tissues today, um, very controversial. But he's really making a very beautiful image with them, an abstractly beautiful image. He's done, he tends to go right for things that make us uncomfortable, as I said. Um, he's done morgue shots. He's done A History of Sex, which is a series that's very sexually explicit. He's done images of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, he goes right for subjects that make us uncomfortable. It's interesting to me that knowing about that photograph really requires knowing the substances that are used in making it. Yeah. I mean, you could just look at that, and it could have a completely different title and consider it a, yeah. just an abstract photograph. But he wants you to know what it was made of. Yes, he does. Um, he, he will put it in the title. It, I think that's important. I think it's important to give you both the sort of beautiful abstract sense and then also bring you to reality to tell you what it was actually made with. The third uh, major area where we've seen some giant leaps ahead in contemporary photography has been landscapes. Uh, how have contemporary photographers looked differently at the landscapes from their predecessors? Yeah, if we, we think about Ansel Adams, who's probably the most famous landscape photographer, um, we think about how majestically beautiful he depicted the landscape, how he used such a beautiful full tonal range with the landscape. It has a very godlike presence to it, a very spiritual presence to it. Artists today are more concerned with the interaction of humankind with uh, the landscape. They don't see it as something real separate as Ansel Adams is depicted in his images. This photo called uh, Mount Williamson. Right. This is a photograph by John Fall, um, Rancho Seco. It's a nuclear power plant in California. He's photographed it in a very um, majestic way, somewhat similar to Ansel Adams. But the fact that the subject is this nuclear power plant really makes us look at this very differently. It's, to me, it's a very good example, again, of this lack of objectivity in photographs. In one sense, this photograph could hang in the CEO's office of this power plant. It could also be used by the Sierra Club. I was against. going to say uh, it'd make a perfect ad for a nuclear power plant in mm -hmm. the late 70s, nuclear power making your life more hopeful and positive. Right. I mean, it really depends on where you're coming from. This is an image by Richard Mizrak. Again, it's about that interaction of this beautiful landscape, western landscape again, um, with figures that are just 
unnervingly small. They almost look silly next to this landscape. It's about the interaction, but it's a, it's a sort of funny interaction, these people in bathing suits with this incredibly beautiful pyramid lake um, scene. Another image by Richard Miserac is called Waiting, Edwards Air Force Base. It's, they're waiting for a shuttle landing that's about to take place in this very broad landscape. We look at this and we see all the accoutrements of being human, the tents and the flagpole and all the stuff that we have to look at the landscape with or through. And it questions our relationship to the landscape. We've um, seen photography as it's moved ahead. It's also kind of left behind some elements. Uh, when I was learning photography 20, 25 years ago, you always began doing black and white photos mm -hmm. and developing in the studio. But uh, that's getting harder and harder to do? Well, not really. It is more and more expensive. And I would say the black and white papers that you can commercially buy today have very little silver in them, which is good. We're not putting as many hard metals into the water system but you don't get the kind of richness that you could get at one point with black and white photographs. Also, you can't buy certain kinds of film and certain kinds of large papers anymore in black and white, so it's more limited. Who gets to define art photography today? I would say museums, curators, critics, galleries. Um, they are the support system to um, sell the work. They tend to promote certain people um, and collect certain people and that pretty much defines contemporary photography. We did see in those Cindy Sherman photos though sort of an influence on the art world from yeah. the commercial world of movie stills. Do we sure. see more of that? Oh, I think there's always a cross fertilization between the real world and the art world between all different art mediums, uh, photography, painting, sculpture. Um, they've always influenced each other. You never know which came first. They're all intertwined. How has photography been able to influence other types of art? Well, um, the Cindy Sherman is a good example. I think it was such a clear depiction of a postmodern idea that the whole notion of being postmodern became very understandable after Cindy Sherman and people like Yasumasa Morimura. Um, so that that, I think, has filtered into, again, other world of painting. It is filtered into our language so we can identify postmodern ideas much easier um, with the fact that Cindy Sherman made these photographs. Some of the photos that are coming out now are, are really a little bit removed from photography as we traditionally think of photography because they're somewhat done in computers and sometimes sure. they're set in other contexts with other non-photographic elements. Sure. Will photography continue to exist as an independent art form? Oh, geez, I don't know. I can't see the future, but yes. I think there's, you still need photographers to take images. There are, however, a lot of photographers that don't ever take their own images. They're out there. They can grab images from so many different sources now that it is very different. Our definition of photography is changing. It still has the notion of the old um, photograph being um, shot. And now it's more fused with um, gathering of information. But um, it's changing. I don't know where it's going to go, but at this point, um, it's really in flux. That's interesting, the appropriation of other images. We've seen the rap artists who appropriated a riff here from a James Brown song yeah. and another riff somewhere else in order to create their own yeah. compositions. We're actually seeing that with photographers also, oh, appropriating absolutely. and incorporating it in. Oh, of course. I mean, think of the Yasumasa Moro, where he's appropriating um, exactly images from Rembrandt or Marcel Duchamp or... Um, Van Gogh. Uh, that's a very obvious example of it, but people often appropriate even moods or textures from images. Subject matter. Um, in some ways, it's all been done, and we're just rearranging the elements to some extent. Um, as, te as technology begins to become more and more a part of photography, not that it never ever wasn't, but it sounds yeah. like it's getting more high tech, and when it gets digital, has that meant that it's becoming more and more expensive to do photography? Uh, no. Um, it's expensive to do high-end 
digital output. That is very expensive. Um, you do have to have access. If you're a student, it's not horribly expensive because you have access to digital equipment. Um, but yes, I guess you're right. The, the digital equipment to really do images with the quality of the traditional photographic method does take a lot of money to reproduce. Is the art photography world a completely different place from the, uh, the commercial photography world? We've talked a little bit about how they've influenced one another. But I just I recall so. gospel singers going to sing popular music. They were all of a sudden excluded from the church. Uh, <laughs> is there no going back and forth for art photography and commercial photography? Well, they're really they're made for different purposes. Um, so they really are very different. Um, of course, I think they steal stylistic ideas from each other constantly. Um, but in the commercial world, you're doing a photograph to sell a certain product or to convince the public of a certain thing. Now, yes, that's true. You're trying to convince perhaps the public of something, but it's an idea much less related to commerce than um, the commercial photography. So it's really people's sort of independent visions or ideas that they're portraying. Very but, different context. But commercial photographers seem to want to appropriate the latest uh, hot oh, sure. art form to oh, sure. incorporate into it so the line becomes blurry that way. Yeah, it becomes appropriated before you can even, I mean, it gets appropriated overnight practically. Um, but you can always tell the difference. It's a sort of stylistic choice in terms of, of commercial photography. In um, the art world, it's really more about their statement or the ideas that they're insinuating or their um, conceptual idea. Ellen Garvins, thank you very much for being with us on Upon Reflection. Thank you. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.